good day and welcome to this CNBC Africa broadcast with myself, Zanela Morrison. I'm joined by industry experts today who are going to talk us through some of Africa's biggest breakthroughs, challenges and opportunities to ensure that no African is left behind in the digital transformation, especially as we see the AI revolution setting in and propelling the continent even further. I want to introduce you quickly to my guest, Hardy Pemhiwa. He's the president and Group CEO, CEO of Cassava Technologies. Joining me also is Lillian Barnard. She's the president for Microsoft Africa. Then I'm joined by Juanita Clark, the CEO of Digital Council Africa. And then joining us online, we have two more guests. All the way from London, I have Alex Okosi. He's the managing director for Google Africa. Alex, welcome and thank you. And Carl Manlin, he's the vice president of Inclusive Impact and Sustainability in Central and Eastern Europe. Europe, Middle East, Africa for Visa. And he's joining us all the way from Dubai. What a panel we have set up today. And again, I think this is an incredibly important conversation as we look at the importance of job creation, how this will impact uh, income in countries that are expanding, especially with a working age population, as well as higher income countries facing labor shortages. Well, without further ado, the experts are around the table. And I really want to position a question to you quickly for you to set the scene. Where are you when it comes to uh, the digital revolution and we're looking at AI? How is Microsoft starting to position and propel the continent? Zanella, thank you for having me and it's just fantastic to be here with you today in studio. Now for us as Microsoft, um, you know, embracing AI is central to our vision for Africa. A AI is going to revolutionize everything we do. It's really going to transcend every technological advancement we've ever seen. And I'm happy that you're actually talking about digital transformation and AI transformation because AI transformation is really about applying intelligence on digital transformation because digital transformation is really business transformation. You infuse technology in it. And now that you have the technology, you need to infuse intelligence on it. And as Microsoft, we want to make sure that we make a contribution and really continue to lead the charge. Mm. Thank you so much. I think also I want to come to you next, Hardy, because you, you're heading up Casava Tech. How is a tech-focused company like yourselves uh, also jumping in and complementing this process? Thank you for having me, and it's great to be on such an illustrious panel. Um, I'm not sure that I would say that we're, we are jumping in. Mm. Uh, we've been there from the beginning. Uh, you know, we've been at this for the last 25 odd years, building infrastructure across the continent and seeing Africa move from a place where 70% of the population had never had the phone ring to a place where we can sit here today and talk about AI. Uh, so, so really, when you look at 2063 the 2063 agenda by the AU, sustainable development, inclusive growth, you can't have that without digital transformation. So whether we look at the digital infrastructure that we have been building for the last two decades, really across Africa, whether you look at the data center footprint that we're installing across the continent, you look at financial inclusion and the impact that's having on what people are doing. And now when you look at harnessing the power of cloud and AI, I mean, to Lillian's point, AI is transformative. It's, it's, it's like electricity at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. It's going to change everything that we do. But it's not just gainsay that Africa will benefit from this revolution. We have to do the work. Uh, and we have to do it with intentionality. And I want to come back and, and I want you to unpack that a little bit around the opportunities and the challenges that you have had to um, pie, you know, open up the way for within the continent. And I, and I think that's going to be critical to see how we're doing it for Africa by Africans. Um, Juanita, you then founded the Digital Council for Africa. What role is it playing in, and what does it aim to do in this industry? Thanks, Anelian. Thanks for having me. Um, I suppose I would almost say maybe I'm a bit like the conscience in the room. You know, digital transformation poses so many opportunities for Africans and we can really grow our economy. But we have to do it in a way 
we, we, there's no marginalised, um, you know, nobody's marginalised. Um, everybody's taken on this journey. Um, and what's important for me and what I wake up for every day is to say, how do we make sure that we take connectivity to every person? How do we harness this digital transformation? It would be unfair for me to ask Microsoft or Cassava to hold back their innovation because we're trying to catch up. But at the same time, we're trying to go and to say, how do we go and fetch everybody and take them you know, on this journey? COVID was this uh, tremendous, um, you know, terrible thing that happened. But the one good thing, if there is such a thing that COVID did, is it sort of showed us this digital divide, you know, between those that have access, whose lives could go on, who could continue working, studying, and those that don't. And our role is really to, to look at those policy um, mechanisms that can be implemented to make, sh to make sure that Africans have equal access to these digital opportunities. Mm -hmm because the key to all of this is that nobody must be left behind but I, I think we probably have the greatest threat of people being left behind because the, the divide was already there before this amazing but as usual we see it as an opportunity as Africans um, let's go to the broader stage and talk to Google where Google starts to now look at the education component and the enabling component but the question is really open still uh, to come through to you please Alex what are your thoughts on this topic Look, AI is transformative. I think we've all said it. Um, one of the things that we pride ourselves at Google is that we've been an AI company for some time. And it's really great now that there's a lot of focus on how we can really leverage AI to be able to unleash, especially economic opportunity and growth for, for Africans. Um, for us, one of the things that we've been very focused on doing is to make sure that making sure that Africans are not left behind. Uh, hence, when we launched our AI Research Center, in 2018 and, and in Accra, the purpose was really about that, to be really be able to find ways to leverage AI to solve for some of the challenges that, that we have on the continent, whether when it comes to healthcare or, um, you know, we're doing some great work with Jack around in Kenya, for instance, to make sure that we have AI tools that can really support point of, point of care, um, ultrasound access for from pregnant people. Um, in, 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 our, in the agriculture space, for instance, we're doing work that helps you kind of you know, make sure that you're able to forecast low-cost outbreaks, which can of course be very damaging to farmers. But having our AI research center in, in Accra and also now recently extending that research center to, to Kenya really helps us believe that we are, we are well positioned to be able to do work um, that's gonna be foundational to being able to help to unlock economic opportunity for, the, uh, for our people on the continent. So that's kind of what we're really, really excited about because we're doing work already that's being able to showcase the benefits of AI. But of course, being able to leverage AI across our tools is an, an incredible benefit that we think would go a long way in terms of being able to, again, get the continent not behind or left behind uh, when it comes to the AI revolution or the AI that we have now that's leading the way. Mm, thank you so much. I'm going to jump straight to you, Carl, and I think give us an overview as well from your perspective about this, the journey towards digital divide, but with also leaning in some of the work Visa is doing on, on social impact. I mean, when I listen to colleagues around the table, what it tells us is that the 500 million consumers and the 40 million merchants across Africa that need access are actually in a place to be better served. Financial services relies on the technology that colleagues have been speaking about. And it's a partnership between all of these that allows us to actually advance. From an AI perspective, the key part is cybersecurity and how do we leverage artificial intelligence so that individuals that are coming onto the financial services platform actually feel safe and secure. And of course, those are also um, already on those platforms. So the key is really to think about what's the outcome? How do we enable merchants? How do we enable individuals? to really take advantage of this platform that exists. And it's true, it's steady steps, but every step actually helps individuals to make progress in what they do, being at school, being in a business, or actually being a woman on the side, on the side of the road trading that has suddenly access to financial services. You have to love and appreciate the collaboration that, uh, that he's talking about. And Lillian, I, I think we spoke a lot about, initially we used to hear the word collaboration, uh, and now we're seeing public and private partnerships coming to the fore. Uh, how have these started to uh, evolve in the, in the business that you are in? I mean, and I think we're sitting with some of your collaborators in the room. 
I love the question. And, um, and, and before I talk about collaboration, I think it's very important when we talk about AI, we must contextualize the opportunity for Africa because this is what excites me. So a PwC study came out to say that should Africa only cap to 10% of the global AI opportunity, it will contribute $1.5 trillion to the African economy. That should excite all of us, which means as well that there will be enough opportunity for everyone and we're gonna have to collaborate. It is about public private sector. It's about some of the work that we're doing with cassava technologies, making sure that we bring connectivity to our people, especially in rural areas. It is this whole notion around making sure that no one gets left behind. Because literally, if you think about the power of AI, and now we're not just talking about AI, we're talking about generative AI. Generative AI is giving us an opportunity to really democratize this technology. And when we come back, we need to talk about partnerships in terms of making sure we provide the infrastructure, we provide the skilling, we make sure that we give our SMEs, you know, the tools and the tech they need so that we can actually spawn more, you know, small businesses because Africa was built on small businesses. And maybe the last part to mention, I think, and that is a whole piece around what are we going to do around regulation, right? Because Yonita talked about it. We need to make sure that we open up regulation. We need to provide a bit more illumination, working with governments on it to say, what will regulation look like in this new era of AI? And, and I want to touch on that because we've seen great agility in the space of regulation and policy. But before we go there, um, you know, I, I think you also can really speak to what these collaborations have meant because as a global organization now, the field for you is, you know, it, it's really the world is your oyster. How have you seen your ability to bring that and harness it for the industry? So we, we, you know, we, we, we play with words a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, and we say AI for us means African intelligence. Uh, and we started saying this you know, some time ago. Uh, I, I think that there are unique challenges on the continent that require a keen understanding of where the continent is and where we need to go. We still need to solve the problem of the cost of access. We need to solve the problems of the cost of devices. We need to solve the problem of digital skills. So we bring that into the partnership conversations that we have with Google, with Microsoft, with people in the, in the uh, Digital Council, with governments uh, to say, look, le let's not kid ourselves. There is this $1.5 trillion opportunity that's ahead of us. We have to have our ducks in a row. So you know, if I look at the journey that we have walked over the last 25 years, from the first kilometer of fiber that we started to build, uh, and now we've got Cape Town to Cairo done, we've got Mombasa to Mwanda done, we have Port Sudan to Lagos done. We've got 300 towns and cities in between. So the digital infrastructure is now starting to take shape. We've got data centers that are starting to pop up across the major economic centers. Uh, we've got, so we're now able to go to global players like Microsoft and say, hang on, Africa isn't where it was 25 years ago. We're here. Uh, and we're able to have a meaningful conversation about you bringing the global tech that you have, that you are applying to all the other regions in the world. Our dream is valid. We want to play in this new digital economy. And, and when we came up with this vision of a digitally connected future that leaves no African behind, it, it really was based on that. It was based on the fact that everyone that was previously excluded has a valid dream that we need to bring into this digital future that we're building with our partners. Because everybody deserves a chance to realize their dreams. Exactly. Every single person. Everybody. But but Africa has proven itself to be extremely agile and very innovative. If you look at our financial services sector, I mean, you cannot compare it. Uh, what we can do and how we pay, you know, people still marvel. But we've always considered regulatory as if they were holding the, the strings, right, and holding us back. Have we loosened and made those elastic so that regulation and policy and all of that is keeping up with you know, the speed at which we can do things? Look, I think it's important that credit is given where credit's due. You know, the South African government particularly um, last year passed two critically important policy directions which, um, which seeks to enable, um, you know, how companies can deploy 
infrastructure, specifically fiber and towers, um, how they can do so rapidly. Um, it tries to remove some of the red tape associated with the deployment. I think where there's still, still some concerns um, is I think we need some harmonization across Africa. You know, we need to take some of these policy directions um, and, and, you know, uh, through the AFCTA and, and some of the very important bodies that we've got, we need to adopt these um, as a standard across to make it easier for investors to invest in countries, to understand the re regulatory landscapes um, and to, uh, you know, continue doing that. Um, and with that also, you know, educating municipalities, local authorities on the importance of infrastructure so that they make it easier to, um, you know, for organizations like Asava to deploy infrastructure uh, to connect, um, especially in areas where the business case doesn't always stack up, you know. Um, and that's also where the PPPs come in, I think, you know. There's going to be a, there has to be a meeting place where, you know, some form of government support comes in with private sector to make sure that we reach every single person. Um, and it's important that the private sector continues to speak to government to, you know, it's like where does government start and private sector end and where does private sector start and government end and, um, and how do we bring these together to make sure that we really deliver on the promise of this incredible future that we've got. And, and for me, great respect on the organizations that are doing that across the continent because that, that lends itself to me going straight through to, to Carl. And I want to ask Carl to talk about Visa's experience working across the continent, creating that harmonization, what are some of the lessons uh, that you can impart on, on what it's been like to just travel the continent and solutions are the same, but you're creating harmony? So I'll give you an example. In Nigeria, we have a fintech called Fiverr Greek, and Fiverr Greek works with 500,000 farmers across three markets. And what they do, they actually capture data on the production, they capture data on what they're actually producing so that when they speak to financial institutions, there's actually data to back and support them, but also they can optimize their production and actually sell. So a FinTech element is a critical aspect of it because these are young people that see opportunities, that see solutions that can be fixed. And a company like Visa comes and support them with infrastructure that they require, but also the networks. So if you think about it, it's never a solution where we come with what we have, but we actually understand what the needs are in specific market and how do we help someone like Fiverr Greek in Nigeria or Neoli in Morocco that works with artisans so that they can come into the digital economy. Because what we recognize is that a lot of Africans, especially the young ones, have the skills and knowledge. Sometimes all it takes is somebody to listen and make sure that they actually take that step forward. So it's really what it's been about. And then you mentioned earlier the point around regulation. It's always a dialogue because we had the adventure of seeing what's happening in multiple markets around the world. And being able to tell different regulators, these are some of the cases that might be useful as you're making a decision. So it's, it's by design a collaborative exercise because Visa is an invisible infrastructure. And that invisible infrastructure needs to translate into the reality in terms of job creation opportunities for young people and women, especially women-led SMEs. And on the back of, uh, of everything that this team does is a lot of data and intelligence and Alex, uh, uh, Google is, is seen as an engine for knowledge but you're working a lot on data how are you taking and brewing this African intelligence with all the input that you are getting from all the people especially the young people that are on your platform look I think you know at the end of the day what's really critical is that we we understand that you know data is only really critical if you make sure that the data is relevant for users on the ground. So for us, our focus has always been on how do we make sure that, especially when it comes to AI or when it comes to infrastructure development, or when it comes to actually investing um, in the ecosystem, that we are doing all the right things possible to be able to enable it. Um, so in a lot of ways, I think, you know, Hardy talked about earlier about what, what are the foundations before you even start talking about data, et cetera, what are the foundations that one needs to establish? And I think it is about infrastructure to start with. Um, and to the point I mentioned earlier, that's why we were really excited about being able to land our Equiano, you know, on the sea cable across the, the west coast of the continent to make sure that we, again, access is better provided that can come from partnerships um, with, with Hardy and his team, and, you know, making sure that we deliver uh, internet access. But the other critical piece in all of this is when all is said and done, um, going understanding that we have 
small businesses really th drive the majority of, of business on our continent today. It's about also making sure that we are creating an ecosystem that enables startups to be able to thrive. One of the things that we're really excited about is that we've, you know, you know, over the, since 2018, we've launched our Google Accelerator program to really enable a lot of startups, over 100 startups who combined have raised within them over $250 million to be able to play in the tech space and be able to create solutions that speak relevantly to the challenges we have on the continent. So I think it's an ecosystem of making sure that you have infrastructure investment, making sure that you are training and developing the, the uh, you know, the continent, i.e. Our, our communities on the ground and the individuals that will help us get to the next place, but also making sure that you're partnering and you have a great framework um, working with governments to make sure that the frameworks are in place that allows regulation that enables growth versus regulation that stops growth. I think what, the one thing that we've seen, even with our work with the African Union, is their digital transformation strategy is a great blueprint for where we could be moving forward from an, from an Africa perspective. So as we think about us as a company, it's not just about the data um, in terms of what we can do, but it's really making sure that we are our products are really as relevant as possible in enabling Africans to unlock economic opportunity. So that's how we think about it. Mm. Did you hear that um, Carl mentioned your 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 uh, your what is it your motto? He said, you know, how can we help? Uh, <laughs> and and I'm actually going to use that a little bit because I find it so useful because you already opened the door towards business and individuals. And and that question is really is how are you helping? And Lillian, for, for you the question: How are you starting to help individuals and businesses when they're using your suite of products? How are you leaping them to be able to just make it easier and simpler? So I would love to start, and I'm back to the point I made, um, Zanella, around the opportunity. And I want to come to the youth in Africa because all of us talk about this youth and what are we going to do with our youth. And if you think about what AI will bring for us, should we give them the right skills and should we give them the right, you know, AI education? We can absolutely provide, you know, the globe with the workforce of the future. We have invested a lot in training and skills development programs. In fact, uh, we have a Youth in Africa initiative together with the Africa Development Bank. And the numbers sound big, but if you think about the context, of course, there's more to be done. We are training, you know, 50 million people across the continent. We're thinking about getting about 25 million of those people into jobs, but more importantly, also making sure that we show people how to start businesses. We've got, for example, Founders Harp, and it's about how do you help people getting access to finances, showing them how to set up a business, run a sustainable business, and making sure that it is a digital business. And I think the power of this technology in terms of, you know, how we're helping is we are providing, and I mean, you know, we don't, well, don't want to pretend that we've got all the answers, right? But we want to provide more in-depth view in terms of what Africa is supposed to do with AI. Because if you look at what's available today, we talk about AI, but what is AI today, really? It is about those enhancements in business. So we kind of say four things. What will you do for your employees if you are a business? What can you do around your operations? How can you improve them? If you think about manufacturing, right? How do they build agility in their supply chains? Banks are worried about security. How do, does AI help them with that? Let's talk about health. Health is a challenge across this continent. How do we drive better health outcomes? Isn't it time that we show our governments, you know, the power of technology and how AI can really help, how you can really give someone sitting in rural Africa the same healthcare experience than someone who's sitting actually, you know, in suburban urban Africa. And there's a lot of examples, right? We just recently launched the AI uh, in Africa white paper, and it's called Meeting the Opportunity. And in there, we've captured a plethora of examples in healthcare, in agriculture. Uh, we talk about deforestation. How do you prevent that? We talk about, you know, in the legal world, how do you give everybody, you know, access, you know, to legal advice, because what we want to show everyone is that AI is already in Africa. It's not about something that is coming, it is here. And we talk about the data sets, and we say the data sets coming out of Europe and the U.S. are not enough for Africa, but hey, we've already developed that, and I think how we, I, we want to help is to show the possibilities and how we need to be brave, brave around, you know, venturing into, you know, this AI era to make sure that as Africa, we truly can take that leap. Mm -hmm. 
and the, the solutions are there. I find that there is so much for us to harness, to take, as you say, Lillian, to rural areas um, across different continents. There's so much for us we need to share. Heidi, how well are we doing in taking that, that you know, that what's there and starting to make sure that um, a hard operation that can be done via scope or, or, a, or, a, or a, a mother who can have her child detected, you know, whether there are any heart problems in utero. How are, we, how are we able to take simple solutions like that and just make them land anyway in the continent? Yeah, I mean, good, good question. Um, you know, our regulators get a lot of flack. Uh, and, and I think t today I just want to shout out to our regulators and our governments. Because we now have 85% of the African population covered with some form of access technology that allows them to participate. Uh, if you think what a journey that has been, uh, and that has, a, that has been at a time when we've all been shouting at our regulators, they need to do more. I think they've done what they need to do. So that's on one end. So 680 million Africans today have got access to some form of mobile broadband. Uh, whether they use it or not is another, is another question, but they've got access to it. 70% of the global mobile money transactions are done on this continent. You know, that is incredible in terms of just, if you think about what we have had to surmount as challenges. So, so that's the backdrop against which we need to measure how far we have come. But if we go micro, uh, you know, let me just take our own examples as cassava technologies. Foundationally, uh, education is important. So we have been on a pathway to map all the schools across Africa. Exactly where is this school? How far is the school from a fiber broadband network, from a metro network? What kind of access technologies are available in order to connect the school? Are they connected? What would it take to connect them? And we're working with UNICEF, we're working with Microsoft, we're working with Google because it, it requires collaboration. The problem is that big. We've mapped 22,000 schools so far. We've connected 5,000 schools to, to fiber broadband. We've just signed you know, this year a program with Epson where we are facilitating 80 schools in Kenya to have access to the next generation of technologies in the classroom. We're doing the same thing in Zambia. So, you know, th these are sporadic examples of the successes that Cassava Technologies with Microsoft, with Google, with Visa and others are bringing to bear on what I believe is really Africa's biggest opportunity on one hand and perhaps Africa's biggest problem if we don't win in this space. Africa's single largest problem is youth unemployment. What AI does is to give us a real chance at making a dent at this problem. So it's no longer a wicked problem as it was 10 years ago. 10 years ago, we would have been pulling our hair out to say, how do we create employment mm. for this burgeoning youth population that are restive, that we're educating, uh, and that have got a number of people that are willing to misuse them uh, in order to create problems. So as business leaders, you know, this is not a government problem. This is about sustainability of our businesses. These are our future customers, but let me scratch that. These are our present customers. Mm -hmm. uh, they are the biggest consumers of digital. Uh, so, so really, that, that's what we have to continue to drive this conversation. And again, you know, thank you for, mm -hmm. for getting us together and, 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 uh, and, and really talking about why does this matter to your viewer or to your listener? It matters because if we don't win on youth unemployment, we lose. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. And actually the world loses, yes. if really. not just us, the whole world loses if we lose on unemployment yes. and, and, and because that comes with a lack of education and a lack of access. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. I just wanted to add to what, what Hardy was saying, you know, and, and what digital has done is, is remove the borders. So historically, a young person would have had to, uh, if, if they wanted to have a job in the US or any other African or market or African country or anywhere in the world, they would literally have to pick up and move their family there and, and leave their loved ones behind. The borders have been removed. You can now live here and have a, a job anywhere in the world. 
have a career anywhere in the world. Um, you know, remote work is, is, has become commonplace. We're all working. We were just sitting chatting before the session about where in the world are we? You know, which airplane are you on? Where are you landing? And I think, Hardy, you were saying home is where you are. Uh, in that moment mm -hmm. is, you know, that's oh, what there's real. Yeah. And your cell phone yeah, and, yeah. and without those two. Yeah. But Heidi also mentioned that, um, like, uh, kudos to, to regulators, but kudos to people as well, people in business, organizations and corporates. Uh, don't you feel that there's been a complete mindset change? There's been, there's been a, a generosity that I have seen that I, I did not see before COVID. But I, I think there's a much broader uh, generosity amongst corporates. So when you sit with council members, you know, is that what you see? What do you see that's an, that enables us to be who we are today for the youth that are coming? I think, I think unfortunately COVID was that great equalizer. You know, COVID showed us our humanity. It showed us our vulnerability. Before COVID, we all became equal. You know, COVID was just as it was going to take who it wanted to take. And I think what it taught us is that we need to look out for each other, that we have to stand together, that we've got to find solutions together, you know, that we've got to do what's good for ourselves. I mean, we talk about, about youth unemployment and we have to find solutions to this. We have to... Um, bring every single person online to make sure that they can harness this. Skills development, not just skills development in, in new skills, but we've got to reskill. You know, we've got to, we've got to really reskill our continent and how we were thinking and how we're going to harness. You know, AI is still, for a lot of people, a complex term. You know, people see robots and, uh, you know, taking over the world. You know, it's like, you know, people don't understand the, um, the power of AI and how transformative that's going to be and how that's going to positively impact um, our lives if we can all embrace it and, and, and move together. Let me tell you, I am hugely jealous of the youth of today because when I started off, I did not have a co-pilot. And as I was typing, the co-pilot is making suggestions. I mean, till today, they, I'm like, what did you just say? And I literally <laughs> talked to my AI to, uh, yes, thank you for the contribution. It's really an incredible way to, to I think, jump so over, so over so many learning hurdles, but it's a new type of challenge. Alex, how is Google handling this new type of challenge? Yes, the, your academy is fantastic and lots of students coming through it. And, and you've also freed up information, again, that generosity, really freed up your content. Um, but how is learning itself changed and how you're empowering youth? Look, I think there's, you know, beyond uh, what you know of us as me, which has been able to create, create great certification courses and trainings for, for young people to be able to thrive in this space. Um, I think it's, it's really more or less continuing to lean into that. But also, I think it's important that, that as we celebrate all of this, and I think we need to go back to this foundation, there's a vast amount of our young population that still find it incredibly expensive to get onto the internet and that digital device still exists. So I think that you know the work still needs to be continuing to the work that everyone is doing, which is investing in the infrastructure in the space, but also investing in ways to be able to bring down the cost so that this immense amount of young people are able to access this information, be able to now be part of this AI world um, so they can be able to create opportunities for themselves. So I think that's a, a really critical piece. And, and as you mentioned earlier, um, the, the, a lot of kudos um, you know, to governments and to regulators in terms of, make, you know, playing their part in, in partnerships. But I do think it's really critical that as, as all of us in the, digital, in the digital technology space, that we continue to work with them closely to make sure that they understand the impact of regulations and to make sure that there's regulations that are going to be enabling uh, for, you know, for our young people to, to thrive. But absolutely, I think it's important that the education um, today is overhauled and is not, and is a lot more focused on ICT education. Um, there's a lot of work that we need to do with our institutions to make sure that that is the, that's the case, but also to encourage our young people that there, there's education out there uh, with technology and the access to the internet. There's there's definitely a lot of e-learning opportunities for them to be able to upskill themselves and understand how to really leverage the power of AI to be able to grow themselves. So I think that is, you know, that is the one thing that we're focused on is being able to also evolve our training to make sure that the AI component of it is a large part of what we now do moving forward. Because um, to enable this, this future and, and the today actually that we have of our population and young people, we have to really lean into that. And that's the opportunity we have. If we had to tap into, you know, you know, what is supposed to be almost up to $25 trillion in annual 
global contribution to economic revenue globally. We need to now make sure that Africa, Africans are well equipped to be able to tap into that. Mm. We actually want to expand on that question because I think Visa uh, is working with youth to solve some of the things that you spoke about. So I'll come to you in just a moment, Carl, but I would love to ask you, our viewers, please, if you have any comments, any questions, please uh, do share them with us um, on the social media handles that we'll provide uh, below. Any question, any comment, uh, please lean in. Carl, uh, Visa runs the competitions, which I know of, but I'm sure you're doing so much more to get young people to create some of these solutions for themselves, uh, not just for themselves, but for their communities or for their traders or for problems that they want to solve. You know, give us a little bit of insight into how you're doing that. Are you seeing it really change the landscape? So I'll, I'll go back on your point around generosity. We probably forgot that in 2015, African business leaders met in Addis Ababa and put on the table about $34 million for Ebola. And at the time, this was only less than 2% of Africa's GDP that was at risk. But they realized that the issue was a continental issue for which for the first time, they all came together under the African Union and allowed African health workers to go to West Africa and help to stimmy uh, uh, Ebola. That one is often forgotten, but it was a significant moment in the sort of generosity that cross-border generosity that actually came together to solve that problem that really affected us back then. On what we do, I think one element that is coming around education is financial education. And we realize that financial education with the sophisticated tools that individuals have, especially Gen Z, they have to have a better understanding of financial education, not only for themselves, but also for the communities and their parents. So at Visa, for more than 30 years now, we have developed tools and assets to make sure that every client, everyone that comes to us, we make it available for free because without that understanding, it becomes very difficult for individuals to understand how to build capital and maintain capital. And that's a key part of really building the, the ecosystem. On the competitions, there are two major ones that we focus on. One is called the Visa Every Initiative. And when I spoke about IO from Thriver Greek, he came from this competition. He won the, the CIMIA, so Central and Eastern Europe, Middle East and Africa, and he won the global competition for fintechs in terms of solving real problems in, in the community. And agriculture is certainly one of the key aspects of solving for these issues on the continent. The second one is called She's Next, and is really focused on women-led businesses. And how do we make sure that women-led businesses in partnership with some of our financial institution, but also other partners like the International Trade Center, provide, are, are provided with seed capital, training, access to make sure that the business can grow. And the third piece of it, comes from our foundation. So Visa Foundation actually invests capital in entities like Arua Capital to make sure that they can own land to small, medium businesses. So the way we look at it is really from what does Inc. can do, what does, what does the foundation can do, but most importantly, how do we unlock capital? So that if you're small, if you're micro, you have a pathway to make sure that you actually get access to that capital that can allow you primarily to expand markets and actually cross borders with those opportunities. Mm. So the money is there. That's where you started. The money is there. There's lots of money. But um, if we solve for women and we solve for youth, we would have done a great deal of good for the continent. Uh, I'll come back and see if that's still what is your overall message. But I wanted to ask you each one is when you go to bed at night, when you wake up in the morning, what is the one thing that you still think about? Democratize. How do we democratize this technology? to ensure that no one gets left behind. And I love the piece around women because we just uh, celebrated, you know, International Women's Day. And when we had our event, actually our event across uh, CMR, we talked about no woman getting left behind in the era of AI. Because very often women get left behind. And if we're not intentional in the era of AI, we will find that also that they will get left behind. So for me, that is democratized and it's, and why democratize for me is understanding the power. You talked about Copilot, and I want to go back to talking about generative AI because we saw that we talked about AI for a long time, but when Chat GPT came out, it started grabbing headlines. And everybody was talking about this technology that was so interactive. You typing a command. And the big part about that is you can now interact with this technology using natural language. That means 
we have eradicated the fact that you have to be an IT fundi for you to interact with technology because that has always been a barrier. So that means anyone with access to the internet, and it's exactly what Hardy was talking about, how do we then open up more access, can interact with this technology. Everyone who's got access to a computer, to a phone, can interact with this technology and understand the power thereof. And often we do get asked the question to say, you talk about Copilot. What does Copilot mean? Copilot is really your AI-powered assistant. We talked, we said Copilot for a reason and not autopilot because we always believe that technology should work with people. It is about augmenting human ingenuity. So now that we will give technology the tedious, mundane stuff to do, we're going to allow humans to do what humans can do best because I think it's important that we continue to educate as we, you know, open up access to this technology. So even if people, you know, think about developing and, you know, and starting their own businesses, they don't have to start from ground zero. They already can take a leap because they can now co-create with this technology called AI. Can you understand the leap? You don't, need, you don't need to go find the document. You don't need to go find the person. You don't need to go find the, 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 the company that's done what you've done. You just, it's there. You just ask one source for every single thing that you need. So uh, definitely a new era. What keeps you awake, Juanita? A very smart lady a couple of years ago said to me, if you're not intentionally including, you're unintentionally excluding. I've got to tell you, Lillian, I've quoted it a million times because it's so powerful through every aspect of our lives. You know, we talk about devices. Every single one, I've got a, one of us has got a device that's lying in a drawer, an old laptop, an old tablet. Clean it up, for heaven's sake. Put it into the hands of somebody that can still use it. You know, we upgrade. We've got the latest and the best of everything. Pass the rest on. Give it to people that can still use it. You know, we've got this big digital divide, this gap. How do we? And it can be simple things. You know, we can do simple things to make sure that we are creating a more inclusive society. So go fetch that old tablet, that old phone, that old. Give it to somebody that can still get some life out of it and that can access these opportunities. And I can say, I think the heart is there. The heart to do exactly that is there. But I'm surprised that you still get such, so much pleasure from technology and what it's able to do. But what still keeps you awake? The enormity of the task. Um, I, I think when we think about the previous revolutions that Africa has missed, and where we find ourselves as a continent, uh, I, I can't countenance the possibility of Africa missing this one. It will be catastrophic for us, given our demographics, given our contribution to the world population, and our minuscule contribution still to, I mean, Africa only has 3% of the data centers across the world. Uh, so that's, that's, that's one thing. Uh, but at a practical level, the cost of access still, everything that we're talking about today, if we don't solve the cost of access issue, and it needs all of us, it needs people like us at, at Cassava Technologies with our One Africa Fiber Broadband Network, it needs our partnership with Google, where we are trying to bring down the cost of a gigabyte to less than 10 US cents. It needs our partnership with Microsoft to bring cloud to SMEs and to schools and to individuals. It needs our partnerships with governments in order to make sure that we are releasing spectrum for broadband usage. It needs partnerships with regulators uh, in order to be sure that when we start to densify these networks and bring them closer to where people are living, that there is some kind of an acknowledgement that the last mile is the most difficult mile. Uh, the unity economics of getting to the last mile is that it, it, it costs half a penny to send a gigabyte of data from Lisbon to Mombasa uh, or from Marseille to Mombasa. It costs maybe 10 US cents to take it from Mombasa to Nairobi. That cost jumps to a dollar fifty from our data center in Nairobi to five kilometers away from the data center because of the middle and the last mile. So, so yes, we've got all these exciting things. We've got AI, uh, but we have to be able to enable access. We have to be conscious about the previously excluded 
and being very intentional about going where they are and making sure that we can be able to bring them into this prosperous Africa that, that is inclusive. Because if we don't, uh, then we are, we are mm. intentionally excluding, as, as uh, Juanita says. So that, that's uh, lots to stay awake at night for, but also I think we uh, lots to stay at, awake at night celebrating. Uh, about where we are and the fact that you know we've got 680 million people connected mm -hmm. and uh, we're doing great things with mobile money that you know uh, you go to to the so-called first world we we can teach them a lot true of a leader he can paint this picture of just how enormous the task is and my and my heart my my stomach is sitting in my chest and then he says but then we have to celebrate because we're doing incredible things but I, I think the assurance is that we've got great leaders at the helm I mean I think I sit here talk to so many people we really have great leaders leading these technologies and it gives us a lot of faith and and I think uh, for me as well this feeling that I have that the task is well sharing it with Hardy that the task is so huge how do you feel Alex um, as you continue your work Work, you know what keeps you awake and and what do you maybe do you also want to celebrate look is there's a lot to celebrate i wish i wasn't awake at night to be quite honest because i can i can use some sleep but um to be honest i think it's the excitement that keeps me awake or at least the immense opportunity we have um africa has a large population of you know even more savvy or tech savvy youth population that really deserves to be able to benefit from the transformative power that I think technology has to offer. And I think if we look at all the things that can make a difference to the lives of our, of our African young people and Africans in general, technology is at the forefront of what can do that. So whether it be, it be AI, whether it be making sure that um, we, we create infrastructure that makes access more, uh, more widely, more wide for, um, for our Africans, it's really what, what excites me is that what do we do you know, what do I do? Um, what do I work on? Uh, what do I, what partnerships as Google do we develop? Um, how do we make our products even more useful and then helpful to Africans? But ultimately, how does all of that come together to unlock economic opportunity for Africans across the board? That is really on a day-to-day -day basis, what excites me, um, but also what keeps me up at night thinking about, are we doing enough? What else can we do to make sure that we're driving towards that vision because uh, we truly want to be able to unlock a lot more economic opportunity because I think that will make a huge difference into where we are uh, from an Africa perspective. So that is, that's what excites me, but also what keeps me up at night. A lot of us uh, really focused in on very similar challenges. Um, and finally, to you, Carl, I think emerging markets, you have a view of so many of them. You know, what, do you, what worries you the most and what do you think um, keeps you coming back and fighting this fight? So what keeps me coming back, um, all of you watch the opening game of the African Cup of Nations and the closing game. You may have seen children that walked on the beach with the players. Those were children of cocoa farmers in Cote d'Ivoire. The parents made a choice to enter the digital economy. And we felt that it was important to give the children an opportunity to be on the world stage. Because when we're talking about digital transformation, it has to be something real, something tangible. And that's one example of what being part of the digital economy can bring to these children that came from the first time to the capital, but they were on the world stage, the best players of the continent. What also keeps me awake, and where do I try to get a good night's sleep because you need to continue the fight the next day, is that we are not too far for getting 40 million merchants access to financial services because they are already doing a lot. If you go to any of the borders, Aflao between Ghana and, uh, and Togo, you have all these women that are selling, giving them the ability to enter larger market financial services with skills is a possibility. And again, we don't go from the assumption that they're coming from zero. The baseline is not zero. Actually, the baseline is much higher. It's what is the ability then to make sure that they reach the full potential at 100%. And that, you know, it keeps me awake at, at the same time it's cause for celebration because there's a lot of progress on the continent. A lot of opportunity um, and a lot of solutions provided by us. But we also are working with so many challenges. 
these are you know sometimes I don't know which way to look. You know, it's agriculture, it's energy, um, it's education. Um, what for you do you feel if we had to wind it down? You know, sometimes you want to say, okay, so what will we see that's different? When I go back to this particular country, what do I want to see that's different? So if we were to win as a continent, where do you think we should win? And you, you, I mean, we should win across all. But where do you think if we won, we would really have won in the right place? Yeah. For me, if I think of it right now, and if you ask me as I travel across the continent in a conversation that I'm having with leaders because we talk quite interchangeably about digital transformation and AI transformation, and pretty much to what Hardy's saying, that we cannot afford as Africa to be left behind in this you know, digital revolution, the fifth industrial revolution, you know, as it being referred to. And, and I believe that across Africa, we need to do work to make sure that we unblock and understand quickly, because I speak at a lot of forums in terms of what is AI, what is AI not, what, what are the threats? Uh, there's a lot of conversation around what the impact of, of that could be on jobs. And I think we quickly need to build on those regulatory frameworks because the AU is doing a whole lot of work and, and I think we need to come together as a continent to make sure that we map, we measure, we put those governance frameworks in place. And I believe that governance is super important for me. And I think it is this whole notion that we all agree that we will you know, design responsible AI. It, it needs to be at the core. It needs to be aligned with societal va values. So we should not think about that for too long because the technology is here. We need to decide if we think about AI in terms of high-risk systems, let's kind of build those frameworks around it to make sure that ultimately we will make sure that when it comes to critical infrastructure, where there's electricity, emergency response, we need to make sure that humans remain in charge. When it comes to content, right, what is being generated by AI, what is not being generated by AI. And I think for me, I find that to be the big discussion because I remember the beginning of the digital transformation era. We were talking so long about it and I saw how slow we were. And whilst we have a lot to solve around bringing more infrastructure, creating more connectivity, we already have something to play with. We need to accelerate that. I would love to see Africa accelerate. I would love for us to trust ourselves that we could own this, that we have momentum and that we could bring about change. And, and we, we've talked about, and I, and I heard Alex also saying it, the base is not zero. Yes. The base is not zero. It is actually moving at quite a pace. Yes. Um, and, uh, and where else, Hardy? Where else do you think we really need to win? I mean, I think that's a great summary from, from you, uh, Lillian, but yes. where else should the person see the change? So 35% of Africa's GDP comes from agriculture. A big portion of our population is still in the rural areas, thankfully. But they are migrating at a high rate into urban areas because of the lack of opportunity in rural areas. So the first place that I would say we need to win, we need to bring technology to bear on agriculture. Uh, and that's why, for example, we we participate every year in choosing and finding agripreneurs across Africa that are harnessing tech uh, to transform agriculture. And we work with various partners in the agriculture value chain in order to bring that to the table. The, the other three places that we have to win is we have to win in education, we have to win in healthcare, and we have to win on the infrastructure side. And, and, and infrastructure across the board, not just because digital infrastructure sits above other layers of infrastructure that, you know, electricity, uh, thankfully, the technology for electricity is now there. You know, I think that electricity is now where we were in sort of 94, 95, when GSM technology was there. It was now just a question of finding the money uh, and building out, uh, you know, with solar and distributed, uh, distributed energy. So for me, those, those are the places that, that we have to win. Uh, we win on infrastructure, we win on education, we win on healthcare, and then we absolutely cannot afford to lose on agriculture and stemming this migration of the rural population to the urban areas because it will create insurmountable challenges for us. Uh, and, and I think, again, back to my starting point on Agenda 2063, 
if we talk about inclusive, if we talk about a prosperous Africa, a prosperous, a prosperous Africa is a prosperous rural Africa. Uh, if, if we can't have a prosperous rural Africa, we can't have a prosperous Africa. And when we talk about not leaving anyone behind, uh, we sometimes think about taking them with, but we actually go to meet them exactly. where they are at and enable them and empower them and secure their safety and security where they are at. I mean, I think this has been a fantastic conversation. I think we could go on uh, for long, but I'm being told over and over that I have run out of time. So I really want to say thank you so much uh, to you for joining me. And thank you to our guests online, uh, Alex, um, as well as Carl. Thank you so much for your time. That is unfortunately how we wrap up today's conversation. But hopefully that's not where this will stay. I want to really thank you as well for joining us. Um, Hardy Pemhiwa, he was the president and group CEO of Casa Technologies, Lillian Barnard, President for Microsoft Africa, Juanita Clark, the CEO of Digital Council Africa, and then joining us online, it was Alex Okosi. He's in London at the moment. He's the Managing Director for uh, Google Africa. Uh, sadly for him, Joburg, uh, South Africa is beautifully hot today, but uh, I don't know. Uh, we hope to see you soon. Carl Mandlin, Vice President of Inclusive Impact and Sustainability in Central and Eastern Europe, Middle East and Africa, and he's from Visa. That's it for today. Let's say good Bye, and we'll catch you again next time.